In this video, we're going to explore the fascinating device known as the galvanic cell. The purpose in life of a galvanic cell is to convert chemical energy in the form of a delta G for a chemical reaction, in particular a redox reaction, into a voltage and into a current. We'll look at the construction of galvanic cells and some of the most important terminology in this video and ultimately progress to the thermodynamics of galvanic cells, learning how we can, for example, manipulate cell voltages to relate the voltage of a cell back to the free energy change associated with its spontaneous redox reaction. To begin with, let's return to this question of whether we can actually build a device that converts chemical energy into electrical energy. Let's consider again the reaction of aluminum solid with copper 2 plus to form aluminum 3 plus and copper metal. The balanced equation includes both reduction and oxidation. We find that the copper is reduced from copper 2 plus to copper metal, and we find that the aluminum is oxidized from aluminum metal to aluminum 3 plus. So as in all redox processes, oxidation and reduction are both built in here. What we can do is separate the oxidation and reduction processes and write them separately using electrons as reactants and products. In the reduction, since the copper 2 plus is gaining electrons, we're going to use the electrons as a reactant in the reduction of copper 2 plus. And since the aluminum metal is losing electrons to form aluminum 3 plus, we're going to use electrons as a product in the reduction reaction. So here they are. Since copper is going from copper 2 plus to copper 0, we need two electrons to accomplish that reduction, and we write them on the reactant side. Notice that the charge is balanced. We've got two positive charges on the copper 2 plus ion, and we've got two negative charges from the two electrons forming copper 0 as the product. This is the reduction. It's an uptake of two electrons by the copper 2 plus cation. The aluminum, on the other hand, is being oxidized. We write the three electrons that are released from the aluminum metal in going from aluminum 0 to aluminum 3 plus on the product side, and this corresponds to an oxidation since aluminum is losing these three electrons. They're being transferred somewhere else. These processes that either take up or release free electrons are not physically reasonable. However, they're very valuable from a conceptual standpoint in thinking about how redox reactions are put together. Every redox reaction is going to involve one oxidation process and one reduction process. These hypothetical processes with electrons as either reactants or products are called half reactions, since they're half of a redox reaction. And they give us a hint as to how we can separate the components of a redox reaction to make electrons move through a wire. Imagine, for example, we put copper 2 plus and copper metal in one beaker and aluminum metal and aluminum 3 plus in another beaker and connected the two pieces of metal by a wire. As the aluminum is oxidized to aluminum 3 plus, six electrons are released. And those six electrons can be contributed to the reduction of copper 2 plus to form copper metal. Notice that the charge is balanced. We release six electrons when two aluminums go from Al0 to Al3+, and we need six electrons to reduce three copper 2 plus ions to three copper metal. This is the conceptual idea behind every galvanic cell. On one side of the cell, we put an oxidation, and this is the source of electrons that move through the wire. A wire connects the oxidation, what's called half cell, to a reduction half cell, where electrons are coming in and reducing a metal cation, typically an aqueous solution, to a metal. The metal actually plates out onto the copper electrode, and so we can see the copper electrode grow. So let's look at this in a little more detail, thinking still about the copper and aluminum system. To begin building our galvanic cell, let's start with a strip of aluminum metal placed in a solution of aluminum 3 plus and a counter ion, let's just call it X minus. Let's connect this aluminum and aluminum 3 plus system to another beaker, which contains a strip of copper metal immersed in a solution of copper 2 plus ions with that same counter ion, let's just call it X minus. If we look at the reduction and oxidation reactions in the upper right of the slide, we see that electrons are going to be released from the aluminum side of the galvanic cell and are going to travel towards the copper half cell. Electrons will move in this direction. So it seems then that we've accomplished our goal, that electrons are going to move spontaneously from the aluminum side to the copper side 
as this spontaneous redox reaction occurs. We're going to start chewing up the aluminum metal because it's becoming aluminum 3 plus, and we're going to start generating copper metal on the opposite side since copper 2 plus ions originally in the liquid solution are going to plate out onto the metal and form copper solid. However, there's a problem here. The problem is that we're causing charge separation as electrons flow and the redox reaction occurs. As copper 2 plus forms copper metal, we're losing positive charges from the beaker on the right. That means that we're going to have an excess of negative charge on the right. And this should make sense given the fact that electrons are flowing into this beaker on the right. We're going to have an excess of negative charge. On the other hand, as electrons are removed from the aluminum metal and aluminum 3 plus is formed, we're going to build up a surplus of positive charges in the other half cell. The energy associated with this charge separation is huge, and it's a problem. After just a little bit of charge separation, electrons are going to spontaneously flow back the other way to ensure that both beakers remain more or less electrically neutral. One way to think about this for the electrically minded out there is that the galvanic cell in this configuration is basically acting like a big capacitor. It's an open circuit, and on one side we're getting a buildup of positive charge, just like we would get in a capacitor, and on the other side we're getting a buildup of negative charge. This is one way to store electrical energy to be sure, but we're not going to get any current flowing through this device since it's an open circuit. What we need is a way to close the loop. Without a means to carry negative charge back in the form of something that's not electrons via the wire, right, to the aluminum electrode, the cell won't function. We need some means to funnel charge, not in the form of electrons, but in the form of ions from one beaker to another. To achieve this and eliminate the charge separation, we use a device known as a salt bridge. An assault bridge can be as simple as a tube connecting the two liquid solutions containing within it a membrane that only allows ions to pass through. This would be what we would call a semi-permeable membrane. The membrane permits the flow only of ions through, and so as negative electrons move to the right as the spontaneous redox reaction occurs, anions will move to the left, closing the loop of negative charge and preventing the buildup of positive and negative charges in the two beakers of the galvanic cell. Typically there's also a little bit of an additional inert salt in here, usually a salt of X minus with a cation M plus, and the M plus cations can flow to the right along with the electrons to ensure that charge balance is maintained as well. This critical piece that closes the loop and prevents unsustainable charge separation is known as a salt bridge, and salt bridge is a critical component of all galvanic cells. Now that we've closed the loop, current will flow spontaneously through the blue wire in the direction indicated, and so we can hook up an electrical load to this, something like a television, for example, in theory, and use the galvanic cell to power that device. Notice that in a galvanic cell, current flows spontaneously in one direction or another. That's because the redox reaction must be spontaneous in one direction or another as long as we're not hooking up two copies of the same half cell to one another. In this particular case, we saw just by throwing aluminum foil into a pot of copper two ions, this redox reaction occurs spontaneously when the two reagents are just mixed. What we're doing when we connect these two half cells via a wire essentially is allowing the reactants to come in contact, at least electrical contact such that the processes of oxidation and reduction, both of which are spontaneous, can happen when electrons flow from one half cell to the other. The important conceptual point is that the reaction inside a galvanic cell is always spontaneous. Let's talk a little bit about the terminology of galvanic cells. We've seen already that this central salt bridge is a critical element. It allows ions to flow back and forth, ensuring charge balance. Every galvanic cell is going to involve two of the beaker-like setups that you see here. It won't always be a beaker, but it will always be conceptually something like this. It's going to be a piece of metal, that's the reduced version of one of the components, along with the oxidized version, typically an aqueous solution. This entire thing is what's known as an electrode. We have another electrode on the other side consisting of reduced copper metal and oxidized copper 2 plus in physical contact with one another in this solution. Coming from each electrode, we have a wire and we have part of the salt bridge. 
electrons are flowing out of the left-hand electrode, and we know that because when we separate out the spontaneous redox reaction into its component oxidation and reduction, the aluminum is undergoing oxidation. That means electrons are flowing out of this electrode through the wire. The electrode at which oxidation occurs is known as the anode. And a good way to remember this is that the anode is the electrode to which anions flow spontaneously. When we look at the other electrode, we notice that electrons are flowing into this electrode. And we can again tell that by separating the spontaneous redox reaction into its oxidation and reduction components and noticing that copper 2 plus is undergoing reduction. If we call the electrode where oxidation is occurring the anode because anions are flowing towards it, then it probably makes sense to call the electrode to which cations are flowing the cathode, and this is exactly what we do. The cathode is the electrode in which reduction occurs. Many students remember this using the mnemonic red cat to emphasize that reduction occurs at the cathode, and then by default, oxidation occurs at the anode. Finally, you'll hear me refer to electrodes interchangeably as half cells. And looking at this picture of a full galvanic cell, it should be fairly clear why we call each of these a half cell, because we need two of these to generate a full galvanic cell. One as the electron donor, in a sense, one as the anode, and one as the electron acceptor, the cathode. How do we make measurements of galvanic cells, and what important measurements are there? Well, one measurement we can make is the current, which is the charge passing a particular point per unit time. So we can just, for example, stick a charge measuring device somewhere in here and measure how much charge passes this particular point in a given amount of time, divide the charge by the time elapsed, and that gives us the current, which is typically measured in amps or amperes. We can also measure the voltage, and this is typically measured by placing leads on the two pieces of metal involved in the cell, such that we're measuring the potential difference between the anode half cell and the cathode half cell. This potential difference, what we can think of as delta V, is equal to V2 minus V1. And we'll typically represent this not with the symbol V or delta V, but with the symbol E for electrical potential difference.